need that. I think you hear me enough that you don't have to record what I'm saying. But that's what. Um, every year at the workshop, we have a short business meeting, and I thought maybe this is a good time to do that. Uh, what's the business meeting for? It's to allow you the time to come and say, we want to host the workshop next year. That we've talked to our elders, and, and the elders agree to that, and that uh, we would like to invite you to come to our church. Do we have any, any people here who's volunteering who've already made that decision? Okay. We don't want our workshops to stop. So I, I plead with you that you go home to your home church and you talk to your home elders and you say, this is very important for the, the deaf all over the United States that we every year have a workshop. But uh, we don't want none. And what happens if churches lose the excitement that we've experienced here this week? And so let's, let's uh, talk to our elders and talk to them and, and uh, be serious about it's good that we go to different places, not the same same place all the time. It's very valuable that we see different churches. Last year in uh, Alabama, a small church in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Excellent workshop. The elders there are very excited and they did a wonderful job. Here, big church, there's a lot of teamwork here. So appreciated the work that so many people did. So talk to your church, talk to your elders, and and if if they agree, then call Dennis and say we want the workshop and we want to invite everybody to come to our our congregation and encourage this national workshop to continue. So pray about that. Talk to elders and Vincent. It's very important. Okay. Second, uh, we always. Uh, since 1979, we've always asked the deaf congregation of workshop to give them money to help our, our deaf camps. We have two deaf camps, one in, in Oklahoma and one in Tennessee. Now, the hearing took up a nice collection last week to support our deaf camps. And I like that. It's called WOW, Worship on Wednesday. And so last Wednesday, they took up a collection and it will help us. And if we add to that, then I believe we can help support both camps. Uh, Frank, uh, are you, where's Frank? He's right there. Exciting to support the collection to support your camp. Began in 79 and every year. Yeah, I, w when they came to California, uh, always needing help, I thought, this is a time to ask the people who benefit to give. So, this is our basket. <laughs> so you had a free lunch today, so instead of that free lunch, put the money in here and help our deaf camp. Uh, Frank will enjoy it, and uh, Dennis will make sure uh, that, um, where is Carl? Carl Moore, uh, we're getting, well, I'm blind over there. Carl Moore would appreciate we help give him the money to help people who want to go to camp, and we have many that want to go, but I need some help. And so we can use this money to help support the people that can can go. So I, I'll have a little prayer and then we'll pass this money bag <laughs> that we don't have a basket and there's plans for it. And let it go up and down. You give, write a check. You can make it to either um, Christian Camp for the Deaf or you make it Christian Deaf Make, make your check to Sunset, and he'll change and give the check to the different camps, okay? So make it to uh, Sunset Church of Christ should be fine, and he'll go downstairs and change and then do, and divide it between the two. We believe you'll be surprised how much we can help each other. Okay. Uh, talk to your elders about inviting the workshop. And second, write your check, give your cash. Now, and we'll split that between the two uh, camps, Tennessee and Oklahoma. Let's pray.
Father, we want to thank you again. We thank you for food. We thank you for uh, Jesus. We thank you for your church. We're just thankful that this national workshop can continue. It's good to see old faces. We missed some the past years that are now gone to be with you. And this is a time we think about them and we remember the love that we share. But we also met new faces here tonight, this year. We're thankful for the new people that are coming to encourage us and help. We're thankful for the new person baptized in the pious. We applaud that and, uh, and know that in heaven angels are singing and you are pleased that another person is accepted and believe in Jesus your son and want to live in him forever. We pray you will accept our prayer of thanksgiving for you. Also now, I want to pray for our Christian parents. We pray for the directors. We pray for their work, that they really touch lives, whether they're young or old, they go to these camps, the fellowship for a week is just fantastic. Helps us to sing, helps us to pray, helps us to hear other lessons, and help us to encourage the young people if possible to give their lives to, to Jesus. So we pray you will bless us as we go into our pockets and we give money at this time to help spread the good news among the two Christian camps. We pray for you, thank you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay.
Dear loving Father in heaven, we offer up our thanks to you that we are all able to be here and worship you today, honor your name. You, We pray that you will bless the speaker that comes forward in a minute, that he will bring forth the word of God to us so that we may feast on your word. That we may learn, we may grow in strength. Please forgive us of our sins and help us always to look to you. We thank you. Ask these things through Jesus' name. Amen. That's right. I'm waiting on the interpreter to uh, start speaking so that way I can see what he's saying and I can get a good lesson out of it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. That's right. Preach the word. It is always great to be here, to be with the people from workshop, people from all over the United States coming together for this event. And we're excited about that, to be able to uh, learn from each of these different lessons and these teachers, always able to gain something. And it's definitely inspiring, help us to live for God. Trying to get the next uh, slide up. Oh, oh, okay. I have the button here. Okay, a little awkward with this thing. There we go. Thank you. Uh oh. Uh, okay. So my theme this afternoon is speak life to the disciples. You know, when we talk about the disciples, often what comes to our mind is the 12 that were with Jesus. But you know, today, each one of us can also bear the name of disciple. It means that we're a follower of Jesus. So we today can say, I am one of the disciples. We can still say that. It's wonderful. I'd like to talk about what the apostles have done in bringing other people to Jesus and what their teaching means to us today. And there's so many things that we can talk about as Jesus' disciples. And we think about the things that the apostles would have learned in the three years that they were able to be with Jesus on this earth and spend that time with him. You know, three years doesn't sound like it's a whole lot of time, but, you know, they were there with him every single day for, you know, 24-7, 365 for three years. You know, we might be together for 52 Sundays and 52 Wednesday nights, and then most of our time is just free time. We're not really uh, involved in this kind of work, but it's really impressive what they were able to do with all that time. I remember uh, one time at camp, you know, we go to camp, uh, it's a week. Really, it's five days or so. So a, uh, a woman came up to me and said that uh, she'd noticed that her son's behavior had greatly improved in just uh, that amount of time. And you think about the fact that we had devotionals every morning and every night. We have classes every single morning. There's a lot that you can learn in four or five days.
And sometimes we just have the attitude that Sunday, you know, uh, we'll, we'll go to worship, and then Wednesday night for an hour, and we'll go to Bible class for an hour on Sunday, an hour on Wednesday night, or, or Sunday evenings. You know, we might be there a total of three hours or so on Sunday, and then uh, adding in Wednesday night, you get about four hours a week. And then you add that at 52 weeks a year, that's a really small amount of time. You know, we really need to look at ourselves and see in what ways that we can improve the different experiences and reflect on the different experiences the disciples were able to have when they were spending so much time with Jesus. We know that Jesus taught that we need to uh, stick with the same teaching. I know Brother Ryan spoke this er this morning um, about how the, the disciples did not leave the teaching or the doctrine they didn't change it. They continued with the same thing that was given by Jesus, and that should continue till the end of the world. You know, today we see many, many different beliefs all around the world. There's so many different ones, different kinds of religions that are out there. There'd be hundreds of them throughout the world. But, you know, the Bible teaches that there is only one church. And we know that the head of the church is Christ. Many of the other beliefs or religions don't accept that as truth. You know, some, uh, some beliefs will talk about how baptism is important to be immersed fully in the water. And then some beliefs teach about infant baptism. Some beliefs teach that you don't need to be baptized, that you simply need to pray a prayer, and then you'd be saved. Think about what, what Jesus looks at and goes, oh, well, okay, you can do that. Eh, maybe you could do that too. Well, we know all these uh, different religions and different belief systems are doing so many different things and we can't trust just whatever we want, but we have to think about the one true branch, the one true vine that was given to us, the one true way. So we're talking about the time with the disciples. I want to look at this passage here. This comes from what we call Jesus' last supper when he was together with the disciples. It reads throughout the, the chapter of John, throughout John 13, the entire chapter gives us a story. But if we read it carefully, you know, there, there might be some uh, <coughs> points that we might miss. So I'd like to share with you this afternoon. And so maybe some of you have already seen these things and thought about them, but, and that's wonderful, but I'd like to share them with you this afternoon. John chapter 13, verse 1. You know, they, they knew, Jesus knew this was going to be the Last Supper. He was preparing them. You know, he's going to take this in remembrance of me. But let's look at, let's look at this. So now, before the pe feast of the Passover, it says that when Jesus knew that was the last hour, he knew his time was coming. I'm, I'm trying to use the, the projector, but I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble right here with the remote, so uh, I'm going to try to point out some things, but n nope. No, that wasn't what I was looking for. Trying to go back. Okay. Jesus knew this was the last hour. Well, how did Jesus know? You know, he, how did he know what was going to happen next? 
He knew what had been planned by God. He knew that he was obeying God's will. He knew this was his last hour. The time was coming. He didn't have long, didn't have a lot of time left to spend with his disciples. But his disciples, they didn't know that. They felt like this was just another day. This is just normal day to day for them. So that, that last hour, that this is his last time with his disciples. Notice that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world. He knew that. Are we going to know when it's our last hour? Are we going to know when it's our last workshop? When it's our last opportunity? No, we're not going to know that. You know, remember what Bob was saying. We want to keep on coming every single year, and we want to just keep on coming. It's, it's important. It's wonderful for us to spend this time together. Not just time for the fellowship, but also for us to share in our desire to serve God. That we can uh, teach each other, learn these different things. So that we may be able to go home and uh, strengthen our home congregation. We gather together. We show God that we still love him. That we still want to know more about him. Or do we just come and say, oh, that, this is an opportunity I can see friends I haven't seen in a long time. No, we come here so we can work for God. That every single day, every single class, we're here for that purpose. To depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world. Jesus loved the disciples. He, he truly loved them. have these constant proofs of Jesus' love. When Jesus came and was born, in the Old Testament law, if you wanted to become a rabbi or, or a preacher, you'd have to become, you have to wait till you were 30 years old. Today, it's not the same way. We're able to uh, bring in young preachers and people who are, are energetic and able to do a lot. And remember, Jesus went out and he picked the 12 men to become his followers. You remember reading about that? So Jesus picked them one by one to come and follow him. think he might come and try to find the most successful people, you know, if we we're going to put it in our terms, he might try to find the rich guy or the one with a good college education, you know, and try to find the most successful individuals he can, but Jesus wasn't looking for that. He picked the man who really his only life experience was being a fisherman. He went and picked the man who was a tax collector. People who didn't have a, a lot of experience, you know. You know, a lot of people would look down on, on tax collectors or someone like that. And those were the people that Jesus picked until he had his 12 apostles. You know, if he picked all, you know, 12 scholarly individuals it might not have felt like 
the regular people could relate to those individuals. And I know everyone here has a different, uh, different level of understanding, but we can all do the work for Christ. We can all roll up our sleeves and get to work. That's what Jesus was showing. He was showing an example, showing a way for us that each one of us can serve God. Jesus was always patiently teaching. You know, they just had to continuously learn and, and try to figure these things out. Well, for the three years he was here, you know, it, it wasn't just a, a few times a year. It was 365 days he's teaching these disciples, helping them to learn. You know, that, that was probably so greatly beneficial for them. You know, we may go to worship services, we may go to workshop and stuff, but that's not always enough. And Jesus bore with them in their errors, in their weaknesses. I know we were in some classes and we were talking about trying to be like Jesus, but we just can't. You know, we were talking about the, uh, you know, the three disciples that went up with Jesus on the mount to, uh, in the garden to pray. Jesus went up by himself to pray, and so what did those three disciples do? Well, they all started nodding off and fall asleep. Fall asleep, each one of them. You know, Maybe they, maybe they were tired. Maybe they had a long day. But don't forget to have an enthusiasm in your heart to be ready to serve Christ. So they come back. The Lord comes back and finds them asleep and wakes them up and says, Come on, you need to pray. You need to better yourself. He comes back again, finds them asleep again, then goes off, and he comes back the third time and uh, find some asleep again. But remember, he was so patient with them. And there's so many different examples we have in Scripture where they would make mistakes. They weren't quite strong enough. They weren't as good a servants of God as they should be. And he was patient with them. Making them the heralds of truth. and the heirs of eternal life. They might go into him. They had to learn how to teach others. And so I remember when Jesus said, he, or the Bible says we know that Jesus knew it was his last hour. He knew this was the last supper, and he's been preparing for his disciples. Now it's time for them to roll up their sleeves after Jesus' death on the cross and go out and do the work. So what does this verse mean, Proverbs 18, 24? It says, A man that has friends must show himself to be friendly. And there is a friend that stays closer than a brother. And think about the... Uh, the way that the disciples were with Jesus while he was in on here on the earth. They were together all the time. They were like brothers with Jesus Christ. That's the reason that we're here today. Now your home congregation, you have leaders, you have workers. We need to work together to keep the church going strong. Wherever you go, at home, or the workshop, you go to camp, or, or it doesn't matter. You're going to see others. You have the chance to be a, a good example.
we can be this person that stays closer than a brother if we are excited and motivated for God. In Ephesians 6, 16, we read, And also use the shield of faith with which you can stop all the burning arrows that come from the evil one. Now, I know people still like to make uh, trouble. For example, I'm not going to name any names or anything, but, um, well, you already know. But think about ISIS. They're willing to go out there and see people be killed, even children, and that makes them happy. As we've, you know, read and, and we've seen and heard that their leadership tells them they're going to be a hero, that they're going to go to heaven if they do these things, that they're going to become famous if they do this. So they may take together explosives or dynamite and uh, put it on themselves and go and blow themselves up and kill them. But when they die, they've died in darkness. They still haven't come to know Jesus Christ, and it's truly sad. <coughs> want to go along and maybe catch a few of these things that we really need to uh, know from this passage. Jesus replied, What I'm doing, you don't understand now, but afterward, you will know. John 13, verse 7. So the disciples were probably pretty puzzled by that. You know, he'd been with them, he'd been teaching them, and he says, you know, you don't really have full knowledge of what's going to happen here. But in a little bit, you're going to understand. They're probably curious, what, they're probably curious as to what exactly that means right there. Notice after the Last Supper that Jesus started to wash the disciples' feet. They were probably pretty puzzled with that as well. John 13, verses 14 and 15 say, I am your Lord and teacher, but I washed your feet. So you should also wash. No, it's you should wash my feet. No, no. So you should wash each other's feet. Especially Peter didn't didn't really understand what was going on here. He said, I did this as an example for you. So you should serve each other just as I served you. Jesus began to wash the feet, and I go, that, well, that's different. And do we do that same thing today? Uh, I'll give you a little bit of explanation in a minute. So we're asking questions. Was this something that we need to do the exact same thing that Jesus said, you know, like, uh, like is this as binding on us as the Lord's Supper is that we need to do every single week? So do we need to literally wash each other's feet? <coughs> Remember, Jesus said, I know you don't understand yet, but you will. So as I was going through and studying this, it's very clear that there is no evidence that Jesus intended this uh, to be something that we would need to continue to do.
We know on the day of Pentecost when they, uh, when the first 3,000 people were baptized on that day, that this wasn't something that was supposed to continue as well. Just like the, the like baptism is, and it was wonderful to see. There's a a new creature this just this afternoon, a new baptism. So we we know that we must do that, but should we also be washing each other's feet? Well, no. So the reason it was not observed by the apostles or the, the primitive Christians, the first Christians, as a religious rite. It was a rite of hospitality at the time among the Jews. It was a common and well-known thing And it, was act, and it was performed by the servants. So is that a requirement for us as well? You know, remember Peter, he sat there and said, Lord, are you going to try to wash my feet? No, no, no. And Jesus said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part in me. And what Peter, of course, says, I, w- I want to... I want to be with you. He says, don't just wash my feet, then wash my face and wash my hands as well. You know, but let's, let's keep going. So something else that is interesting in our study here. So we already talked about how Jesus knew it was his last hour. In the same chapter, John 13, verse 18, we read, I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. So Jesus already knew the ones, remember he had chosen the twelve, he knew those. He knew that beforehand. Before God sent him to earth, he already knew that. So he knew who he had chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of scripture in the Old Testament. He who shared my bread has turned against me. Remember, this is at the Last Supper. Jesus is handing out the bread. He already knows. He already knows who is going to betray him. But Jesus keeps quiet. Continues on. To fulfill the the scripture that was written. He said he already knew it was one of the twelve. He already knew who it was. But he just continued on. He knew the entire time they were together, the entire three years, until finally he came to the Last Supper. I may have jumped ahead there, but he comes to the Last Supper and you have Judas there. Judas had been caught up in in other things. He'd been following Jesus, but he was the one who handled the money bag. Before any of that happened, though, Jesus already knew who it was who's going to betray him. We see in this verse that he already knew who was who was going to betray him. He 
you know, I wonder why we're talking about bread here. You know, I, I notice we have a lot of bread that will come out on our plate or something, you know. And they go and look for a, a snack and grab a, a Coke and some chips or something like that, you know, and have that uh, for a snack. But when you go to uh, other, other places, you go to other nations or something, you try to go look for a snack, find something that you can have to... Uh, to snack on for a little bit. Well, a lot of other countries that their custom is they just have a little bit of bread. And uh, have bread and uh, to drink, have carrot juice. So just kind of drink that, you know. <laughs> you know, let's say carrot juice will really help your eyesight. Uh, not really true, but they have these big carrots, these massive carrots there that they'll sell out there in the market. So we know that Jesus knew all these things before they were going to happen. We read in Psalm uh, 41.9 the Psalm of David, which says, My, yes, my own familiar friend, and whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. You know, you look back and, and think about this prophecy here, what David would have had. They would not have read, read that and probably have thought about that to uh, affect Jesus' life. But Jesus knew, and when he, picked, when he selected the disciples, and he lived during his 33 years on the earth, he already knew about what that verse meant. The people didn't fully understand what that meant. You know, some, some people understood, but it wasn't taught a lot of what that verse has meant. You know, we read Proverbs and then into the, uh, the fulfillment in John at this Last Supper with all the disciples together with Jesus. This, Jesus knows this is his last time to be together with the disciples. We read in John 13, verse 21. So I, w I wish I could highlight some in here, but so when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit. It means that Jesus knew Jesus knew what was about to take place and he testified and said verily verily I say to you that one of you shall betray me he already knew he already knew this whole time. Back when the Old Testament was written, he knew. Can you imagine the, the shock of the apostles? They looked at each other and they wondered. So Peter is curious. He goes up to the Lord and says, Who is it? Is it me? Is it me? I want to know. It, he says, I can't wait to find out. He just heard it. Verse 27 explains.
say after the sop, that, that just means the bread. Satan entered into him. You know, this is this mean talking about temptation. He hadn't fully decided yet. And Jesus said to him, so Jesus has the bread, or, or the sop as it says there. Jesus dipped it into his cup. You know, see it as being wet, and he hands it. That was, the person he handed it to was the person who it was who's going to betray him. Then Jesus said, and this is important, then Jesus said to him, what you do, I want, I want to look at two words right here. Do quickly. Hurry up. Go ahead, go ahead and eat. Hurry up. Go, go. What does that mean? To do quickly. What's he talking about there? Very interesting. This gives a little bit more of an explanation. What did Jesus do with Judas? Jesus did not command Judas to betray him. You know, it wasn't Jesus' idea, he didn't make that decision. He knew what was going to happen so many years before. He already knew what was going to happen. But Jesus left him to his own purpose, left Judas to his own purpose. But Jesus already knew that it was going to be one of them who had betrayed him. People, when Jesus started to talk to Judas, you can imagine the other disciples maybe looking around, trying to figure out what he was saying or what he was talking about. It might have been a little bit quiet. You know, do it quickly. You know. Jesus didn't come. He didn't condemn him. He didn't call him weak or, or get on to him or anything like that. He gave, he gave the bread to Judas. He left him to his own purpose. Let him do what he was going to do. So the other disciples might have looked at him and thought, well, you know, he's the one that keeps the money. Maybe he's going out to buy more food, or maybe he's going out to to give something to the poor or do something with that. But still the disciples are all looking at each other. They don't really understand what's going on. Jesus intended to express enough to reclaim or, or bring back to help Jews to repent. To leave those things out. I, 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 I'm sorry for taking the money. I'm sorry for what I've done. I want, I want to do the right thing now. He wanted Judas to lead a holy life. He wanted to get rid of the th things that were wrong in his life and become clean again. Get rid of those negative things and come back and truly be with Jesus again. That's what we mean by living a holy life. 
and now he brought him to a decision. Just like today, people who are sinners, people who are in the world, we can teach them that they're living in the wrong way. We, and, and it's our duty to teach people. Teach people who haven't yet become Christians. And at some point we have to give them a, a, give them a chance and leave them to their, their own purpose. So maybe someone is ready to change their life. They're ready to come and walk with Jesus and one day become baptized. Walk in that new life with Jesus. And that's wonderful. We keep on teaching the word. We keep on spreading it throughout the world. But then we also have to let everyone have their own decision. Jesus knew that one day he would be gone. He spent all this time teaching the disciples and working with them. And he knew one day that they were going to have to take on the mail and they were going to have to do the work and spread the gospel, establish the church. In our own lives, when we go back to our home congregations, we can learn and we can do great things coming to church, but it shouldn't be limited to just the four hours we spend. It, we should be putting more effort into it, into our entire lives, to live with Jesus Christ. So think about the opportunity that Jesus gave to Judas, that bread. And he eats that bread, and what happens next? I think you may already know. Um, what did Jesus do with Judas? He dipped the bread in his cup and he handed it over to him. He spoke those words to Judas. And Jesus gave Judas to understand Jesus, Judas already knew the plan. And he su submitted it to the conscience of Judas. And remember, Jesus said, do quickly. He said, what you're going to do do quickly. Jesus has spent this time working with him. And he spent this time teaching each and every one of them. He would have been so rich in knowledge of the things that Jesus had taught day by day, hour by hour. All these things that Jesus has, has known from Jesus all the time and the patience he's had in the past. And he's like, now you need to make the decision. You need to do it right now. Uh, there's no excuse. You already know. You know everything that there is to know to make a decision. You already know. So do it quickly. Jesus is doing this in the hope that Judas will make that right decision. And after Jesus does that, what happens? If, Jesus, if Judas was going to relent, if he was going to come back, and he wanted to do it at once, but we notice in John 13, verse 30, where it says that Judas ate the bread that Jesus gave him. And then he immediately went out. He didn't accept Jesus' offer. 
It was like the devil won. He walked away into the darkness. And we read that it was night. He went out into the darkness. And that was his final decision. That's just a sad situation. Each one of us, we hear the word of God. And we need to speak the word of God in love. I've heard some people you know, say, look, if you don't be baptized, you're going to hell. And really get on somebody. Maybe something that takes some time to teach people the truth. If we go out there with the wrong attitude, somebody may lock the door. They may shut off and, and go, okay, I'm, I'm not going to have anything to do with that. If we go out there with no love. And we know that if we're going to show Jesus in our life, we have to have love for each other. If we don't have love for each other, we don't have love for God. We need to live the right way and show that we have the love for God as well. I know time, time's flown here. His hour had come. John 13, verse 1 says, Now we need to war against Satan. We need to fight against him. It truly is mental. Our minds might be full of many wrong things, might be full of lust, our own pleasure and power. It goes in our minds, be in our heart as well. But when we follow fully after Christ and we're baptized, we can clean those things out. When we change, we decide that we're going to serve God. Have that new life. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse ten says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. The things the experiences we've had, the things we've done, decisions we've made, good and bad going to look at that in the day of judgment because God already knows. That everyone may receive the things uh, oh, excuse me. Everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, what that person has done. Whether it be good or bad. when we follow after God and we, and we live for Him, we're able to take those, take those things out of our life. The apostles received the teaching from Jesus and today we can see many different churches start to change, change a little bit, a little bit here, a little bit there. We know, we all know situations where churches have split, elders have split, 
and we need to live in the truth, but so often there's so many things that come at us and we try to just think about ourselves and just what we're going to enjoy. I'll tell you what, the world is terrible today. In America, we permit same-sex marriage. We say that it's, it's okay. You know, we have a lot, of, a lot of people who have really supported that, try to get these little changes. There's so many other things. I, I don't have time to talk about them all, but you all know. You know, this is a, like a picture of trying to clean your clean your brain out, you know. You pull it out and go, oh, that, that needs to be cleaned. You know, I wish we could clean out our mind like that. Do we need to actually do that? No. Maybe some of you are sitting there thinking, uh, that, that would feel weird. And maybe we think about our failures and things we've done wrong and feel that we need to clean out our minds. Imagine if we just kept our same clothes on for a week. You know, you spill some food on it or something like that and you just leave it there. No, we don't do that. You know, we spill something on our, on our clothes. We want to look nice. We go out there and we clean it and we try to look better. But, you know, Jesus is not looking on the outside, but he's looking on the inside. He's looking at what's in our mind, what's in our heart. You know, we may look at, at outward appearance and may look at uh, what's, on, what's on our clothes, but he's looking at what's important, what's in our heart, what's in our mind. Uh, you can't look at a person and, and see what's in, in their mind. But we can look to God. He can show us what should be in our hearts and our minds. So, so maybe th this might offend some of you. I'm not really aiming for that. But I want us to look at this and think about the security of our souls. We need to tell the truth need to obey the commandments of Jesus. We need to obey the commands of God. And they say, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't go there because I don't really learn or, you know, uh, they don't have an interpreter. They don't have a good interpreter. Those are not good excuses. God is never, ever going to accept our excuses. He hates excuses. You know, we go and we, we tell our boss, and it's like, oh, I'm not feeling well. Okay. Uh, and uh, you get the day off, you go out, and you fish, or you go golfing. I was uh, reading the newspaper one time. A man had a picture with a huge fish that he had caught. He had a picture of this huge fish that he caught, but what happened was his boss saw that picture. And it was taken the day that he had called in and said he was sick. He was lying about it. Next day, he came into work and said, yeah, I'm feeling a lot better now. And, uh, you know, he was kind of grinning about it all night. The boss knew about it. He showed him, out, showed him that big picture of him smiling, and then he was fired. You know, when the day of judgment comes, we're not going to be able to go, well, these are the reasons why I, I didn't do it. God knows our hearts. He knows the things that we're aiming for, the things that we love. Something very serious, yes. It's right here. I, I know I've seen 
I know many of you are from Mexico, and I want you to know I love you all. I love you all, each and every one of you. I truly do. And we also know that Jesus loves you, and Jesus loves your soul. If we live for ourselves uh, and not and not for Christ, James chapter four verse seven seventeen says it clearly here. Therefore, to him who knows to do good. And does not do it. To him, it is sin. You know, think of all the excuses that we can make. But God's power is just so much greater than anything else we could do. I know for, for many years, people have tried to come across the border and, and do the right thing and, uh, you know, get a green card or do it by the laws or regulations. But then a lot of people have come over in other ways. And then they're able to come in and get welfare or other government assistance, things like that. I know there's many people who do the right thing and, and follow the, the, uh, the rules and laws and will come and stay for a period of time and then become an American city, citizen. But then there's those who come in other ways and uh, take that that power. I'm not trying to condemn anyone, but right here what we're talking about is about the, um, the importance of doing what, what is right by God so we might save our souls. And we want everyone to be saved and do the right thing and follow, follow up the way that God has outlined. Whenever we are going to go out and do something, we need to make sure that we're going to live right. We put on the full armor of God whenever we go out. And this, this is the last one. I want you to look at this real quick. There's another kind of wall. Reading 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy and I pray God your whole spirit and body be preserved and blameless don't want any, anything anything wrong until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. I want to encourage you. I know I love each and every one of you. But when we look to Christ and say, am I doing the right thing? Uh, I'm not here to judge you or anything. Or, or condemn you or anything like that. We don't want to take over the power of his teaching but when we look at Christ are we doing what is right are we living what is right
I know many of you love America. But sometimes we have to make a decision. Do I love America or do I love the Lord more? If we love God, then we need to follow his teachings. We need to follow his way. Jesus is truth. Jesus is life. So we have to depend on the Bible only. So I hope maybe some of you will consider what the Bible has said and what the story of Judas teaches us. So we know what can also happen to us. I want to be on the holy way, the way that leads to heaven, to those gates. Well, there's a lot of ways that you could get into heaven, but there's nobody who uh, get into a United States, but there's nobody who's going to sneak into heaven. And I want to thank you for your attention, for your consideration. And I love everybody. And I want everyone here to go be with each other in heaven. Thank you for your attention.